Pull out your hose and grab your can. We're about to integrate another Pest Geek podcast. Hi, everybody. Frank Hernandez here, and welcome to the Pest Geek podcast, bringing you the latest information on pests, products, and politics from today's leading industry sources to help you start, manage, and grow your pest control business. Hey, welcome back. Welcome back to this edition of the Pest Geek podcast. I am Frank Hernandez. Your pest geek. I wanted to cover a couple of things with you guys and and bring you up to date. Uh, the pest geek academy is coming along. Uh, however, it is taking a lot longer than we thought. Uh, we're still recording classes. We're still um, dealing with quizzes and setting up that infrastructure. So bigger undertaking than I thought, but that is coming. So um, stay tuned to that. You can always find out what is happening uh, with that class uh, or the lessons that we're putting up at, at the academy by going to pestgeekpodcast.com uh, and going to training. Uh, there you will find the academy uh, that is being built. And um, so we're, we're working on that infrastructure, uh, but this is uh, a little bit more than I anticipated originally to get all this done. So letting you know about that also, Hey, if you guys appreciate uh, what we're doing here, um, you appreciate what I'm doing, what uh, uh, Stephen Van Tassel is doing, um, trying to bring you the best free content um, and be the world's number one pest control training podcast uh, that is free. Uh, if you enjoy it, hey, would you consider donating, supporting us? Uh, it's easy. Just go to pestgeekpodcast.com hit the donate button and whatever you feel that this podcast is worth to you, uh, go ahead and support us. We would greatly, greatly appreciate it. Guys, if your phone is not ringing, if you've been on the, on the, you know, fans about getting maybe an 800 toll free number, or maybe getting a vanity number, you're like one eight 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 got bugs or an easy to remember number like one 800 600 500 to increase the ease of your customers getting a hold of you, contacting you. Um, this is the time you might want to do this. Now, uh, Ring Boost, which is one of the nation's largest provider of these services, came to us and said, hey, would you be interested in promoting this on your podcast? And of course, I said, yes. What, what, I, what he said is, hey, look, we're going to do a 15% and if, we're going to give you a custom page. So we've got our own page, which is, uh, I'll tell you right now, uh, ringboost.com slash pest. If you put in pest 15 at checkout, you look for your number, get the number you, cause you can do this right on their website. If you use our link and the promo code, which is pest, pest 15. Hey guys, you get 15% off. You can do the search right there, buy it right there online. And here is Steven Van Tassel with today's topic. Thanks Frank. Steven Van Tassel here. Wildlife Control Consultant, giving you another episode of Living the Wildlife. As a continuation of last, my last podcast where I dealt with transient skunks or transient skunk damage, we're going to talk this week about domicile damage. Now, let me break that down again for you, for those of you who are just starting with this podcast. Transient damage is when an animal is coming onto a property feeding or gnawing or doing some activity and then leaving, but it doesn't live on the property. Domicile damage is the animal is living on the property of the client that you're been hired by. Why is that distinction important? Well, it's important because it makes a difference as to how do you know you're finished. With domicile damage, you know you're done because the animals are no longer living on the property. Whether you captured them or not is not really relevant at this point because if they're gone, they're gone. That's the damage. Transient damage is much more difficult because the animal isn't living there and how do you know that the animal's not going to come back, right? Or that you caught the right one if you did catch something. So it's much more ethereal, and so I always recommend on transient damage that you're charging on the basis of time or visits rather than by a job because you don't know if that skunk got hit by a car. 
and it can't come back to the property. So that's transient damage. But if you're interested in transient damage control for skunks, go back to last week's uh, podcast and you'll be able to get it there. So this week I wanted to talk about domicile damage. So domicile damage would be a case where a skunk or a family of skunks is living underneath a deck or a porch uh, and that sort of thing. So how are you going to work that out? Well, first of all, let's talk about a couple things. Your client will often call you because they've had a smell. And understand that skunks don't normally spray uh, unless there's something is threatening them or they're ill. So it's contrary to Pepe Le Pew. Uh, people think that if they don't smell anything, they don't have a skunk. And that's simply not true. Uh, you can have skunks underneath your deck or underneath the shed and people not smell anything because skunks don't like the odor any more than most humans do. So it, it's really kind of a red herring. But typically what happens is people begin to know that they have skunks on, on their property because their dog got sprayed. They smelled something because when you're dealing with juveniles at times, juveniles are much more trigger happy. So when someone's walking on the deck, the, the juvenile may be scared and just squirts off a little bit and then people are smelling something. And then they realize, well, I've got something on my property. Otherwise, you're dealing with a situation where people uh, are sometimes will see them. And they'll see a skunk go underneath their deck and they're like, what is this half moon divot underneath my deck for? So uh, that is that would be an example of domiciled, domiciled damage. So how do you go about controlling, controlling that? Well, uh, you have a couple of options that are effective. And we're, let's talk about those. The first option, of course, would be uh, simply trap and remove. So. How would you go about doing that? I would recommend using cage traps because I would suspect most of you are dealing in urban, suburban areas where you're struggling with free range animals. Could you put a con of bear or two over that hole? Um, yes, I don't recommend it uh, because you do run the risk of having a potential spray event when that animal gets hit with a con of bear or you have the potential of killing a cat uh, that may be crawling underneath the deck or shed as well. So that would be a non-target. If you were going to use a counter bear trap, which one would you use? I would suggest using uh, a 120 counter bear, or uh, perhaps you could get away with a, uh, uh, I think it might be called an 80 or 85, where it's the, it's the 55 version, but with two springs. Uh, there are round traps as well. I, I don't have any experience with those. Uh, with skunks, I've only really, because most of my work was with cage traps, but I did, ha I have caught a, a skunk with a, with a con of bear, with a con of bear trap. So, uh, and it thankfully didn't spray. Now you could always put some chicken wire over that trap from the outside so that you're only catching what comes in from the, uh, from underneath the deck. That's assuming the deck is relatively secure. And there's really only one access point or you're going to close off those other access points. And what I mean there by closing off doesn't mean you have to trench screen the entire deck, although that would be awesome. You would just simply you know, put put soil there or you could use some boards, rocks to just sort of cover off other openings. Or you would simply add traps to those other openings as well. But you always want to be careful. You don't know what's underneath there. And if you make a mistake, you got you can't you can't unring the bell when you're using a conibear kind of trap. So I'm not recommending it for you. But for those of you in more rural areas and, and states that are a lot more uh, free with with traps, this that may be an option for you. I would really suggest using cage traps or box traps. So what size would you use? Well, if you're dealing with a single door trap, I would, uh, I would recommend a seven by seven by 24 size trap for a single door. Uh, for a double door, I was a big fan of the Tomahawk 107, which if memory serves, I believe was eight by eight by 28 or 30. But it's a double door trap trap. So what I would do is I would simply place the double door trap over the over the opening and use some plywood 
to uh, cover the gap that would occur because the door sticks out from the cage a little bit and you can't get it flush up against the building. So I would use some plywood boards and uh, fill the gap so I would wedge it up against the side of the of the deck and then place the trap in between the two boards so that way the skunk is funneled into the trap. Now, the, the problem with that, of course, is what happens if you have more than one skunk. Well, you can stack these side by side in sort of a half moon circle around that opening. And as long as you have boards in between your traps and create that half moon so that the there's no way for the animal to walk out of that opening without entering the trap. That's the idea. And you want it ideally in a situation where the only daylight that the animal is seeing is seeing it through the double door. So you would make sure you'd cover your traps, whether with boards or cloth or whatever you would use. I mean, I've talked about covering cage traps, been using cage traps humanely in an earlier podcast. So I would refer you back to that or my book, Being Kind to Animal Pests. So because uh, cage traps aren't necessarily humane, right? So uh, you need to learn how to use your cage traps properly. But you're setting this in sort of a half moon. So how many traps would you set? I would recommend three. Uh, that's three is kind of my standard. Uh, certainly you could add four or five if you wished. Um, if you wanted to try to get that job done as soon as possible, but three is, is, is kind of a nice, is a nice number and uh, allows you to kind of really hit that population underneath that deck very, very quickly. And that's, and so what if you don't have that many, double door traps. Well, I would just simply put a double door in front of the hole, then add some, you know, uh, seven by seven by 24 tra- size traps on each side of it. And again, you're having boards in between so that you're having them sort of stacked up. So it's like an array when the skunk comes out underneath the hole, it has a choice. So when one trap closes, he can go into another one. The 107, the 107 would not be baited, of course, but your seven by seven by 24 traps, because those are single door traps, those would be, those would be baited. And we've talked last week about what you can bait those traps with. And of course, you're covering those traps so you can approach them, uh, without getting sprayed the next day. And, then once you have some captures, you would uh, backfill or just cover that whole opening with some loose soil to see if there's any new activity. If you didn't want to use soil, you could always use uh, dry sticks that are thin, you know, not, a, not necessarily as thin as a toothpick, but you could certainly use that. But they had to be long enough and you just basically place them in front of the hole so that when the animal walks, if an animal walks through, it's pushing them over or breaking them. But you want to make sure they're secure enough so that they're not blowing over in, in any wind. And that would tell you whether there's any activity. And how many days would you want to wait to confirm there's no activity? Well, my rule of thumb is three days of good weather. For skunks, because they, they are not active, below four degrees, below four degrees um, Fahrenheit, then you'd want to you'd want to have good weather because otherwise you don't know if they're denning up. My point is is you would never secure that opening in the sense of trench screening it or repairing it unless you're certain there's no longer any skunks or animals underneath that deck. Always be very very careful to make sure that you are never securing an opening unless you're swear to God certain. That is no longer being used. Now, let's say you don't want to do any of that. You could just cork it with some newspaper. Again, cork it in such a way that the wind isn't going to blow it away and make sure that uh, it's not so tight that it's hard for an animal to push it out of the way. But a skunk should be able to just push that quickly out of the way. And that's basically it. So I would, after you have a capture, I would I would put some sort of a trigger, a movement indicator, as some of my colleagues call it, an animal movement indicator. In, in the hole, have your trap still set. And that way, when you, when it's checked the next day or so, whether you're checking it or having your client check the traps, you know, when you show up, if that newspaper or sticks or soil or is still there without being touched, then you know that hole is no longer being used. And again, assuming good weather. Okay. And that's basically 
it for domicile damage. I mean, it's really straightforward. It's not very hard. There's no reason. The problem that if people are having challenges with with skunks uh, in domicile damage is because they probably don't have the right equipment. And so you need to get quality equipment uh, to do this. And, and it's not very expensive. Uh, I would suggest, however, that when you're using um, these traps that you watch out about the soil underneath the traps because if you're using cage traps that are one by one inch mesh, you understand that skunks that are trapped are going to dig up the soil beneath that trap and you're going to have 10 pounds of soil in each of those traps. So if you don't want that, make sure you're using quarter inch hardware cloth underneath the trap or putting it on a board or you're buying professional version traps well, pro version traps, which are often will use a half by one inch mesh that prevents the skunk from doing a lot of damage below it. And so I think if you're in an area where you don't have to worry about your traps getting stolen, I mean, moving to pro level traps is probably a great idea. It saves you a step. Traps are more expensive. There's more metal in them, so they are heavier and they are more expensive, but it really saves you from having to always worry about what's underneath that trap. And when you're putting traps in proximity to a structure, always consider, am I protecting the structure? Because remember, when an animal is caught in a trap, it's got nothing to do with itself, right? It's got plenty of time. It's not going anywhere. So can it damage the structure? So what happens if you caught a raccoon? Let's say you thought there were skunks underneath there, and all of a sudden you caught a raccoon. That raccoon's going to reach through a half, a one inch by one inch mesh and start damaging anything it can reach within six inches. So what happens if that siding of the house, now all of a sudden you have, you know, a, a, an $80, $100 raccoon, but $200 in siding damage. That includes things like, um, garden hoses. I had a colleague once who said he did was setting a trap on a, in someone's backyard. And f- forgot about the the hose that was right and close to the cat trap that he set. Caught a raccoon. That raccoon pulled all fifty feet of that hose into the into the trap with him. And so he had the guy. He had to buy the landowner a new hose. Right. So think about what can be damaged here. Now, an alternative is going to be if you don't want to use cages. Say you're kind of nervous. Well, you can use box traps. And so there's several box traps available. You have the plastic catch variety, which are basically poly plastic, uh, traps. They're, they're opaque. You can't see through them. You have to look at, see if the door is closed. You have the snare shop PVC tube style traps that are available. There's other box traps in the market that are made out of aluminum or galvanized metal that are somewhat solid and those are available for you uh, as as well and, and the idea is try to get something that's standardized the pvc versions are quite uh quite popular as well as the plastic plastic etch i would suspect suspect the plastic catch versions are more probably more popular now the advantage of those of course is you don't the animal's completely contained so it's not going to be um damaging structure it's not going to be digging up soil but the downside of course is is any feces and urine are stuck in those traps so cleaning of the traps is going to be a little bit of an issue for you uh secondly when it comes to there have been some issues with the plastic catch traps uh, the plastic, the poly version traps, I should say, that is sometimes the, the door has a sharp edge and skunks have a tendency to try to wet, push their paw through the side between the, the wall and the door of the trap. And sometimes they cut their foot. So it can be a little embarrassing seeing some blood, dried blood around that opening. Uh, and that can cause some stress to people. So, uh, you can, uh, file that down so it's not quite as sharp or perhaps take some duct tape and just cover that over to try to dull the, the sharpness there so that you don't have your skunk getting cut up. These are, you know, these are some modifications that you can make with your trap, but you'll, you'll get, you just 
when you buy it, buy a new one, just run your finger along that edge and you'll like get a feel for how sharp that is. But, you know, be careful. And if you can dull that down a little bit, that can go a long way of reducing that particular problem. And so you would do the same thing with the plastic catch, tr- plastic trick traps or the box traps as you would for your cage traps. You would put them in a half moon circle around the hole or you would barricade it up against that hole in a positive trap set. And so there are, there are no double door plastic catch style traps that I'm aware of. So these would all be what would be called positive sets, positive sets in the sense you're positively catching the guilty animal. You're only catching what comes out of the hole. Now, if you're dealing with a time trapping, let's say in February where it's mating season and you think there's a male that's coming in to this female, then you would have one trap set facing away from the hole that would catch the male approaching. So you would catch whatever comes out of the de- out of the hole and then have one trap set facing away from the hole so you catch an animal that's that's walking around on the outside. And uh, that is another option uh, that you can try as well. Understand that in the wintertime, skunks can den up in large numbers. The extent, so you have to kind of do that by feel for your area. You got to get some experience. I think the most I've probably caught in a den was with young. So I didn't have these large winter, winter groups. So I think I might have caught six or seven would probably be my highest numbers. I, I can't ever say that I had big, huge numbers of skunks, but in some parts of the country, these, these family, family units and extended family units, uh, can be quite can be quite large, um, but typically I was catching probably three to four when a female with young, maybe five, uh, but it wasn't that it wasn't that much. Uh, but you have to kind of feel, but just be prepared. You know, look at look at what the numbers are in your particular area. You should be keeping records, and I've talked about this in the past. But you can see it's not very complicated, um, and so then you're. Remove, and you remove those skunks and you dispatch them and handle them according to your state regulations. So what do you do in, in, in issues where children are a problem, dogs are a problem? You got to have frank conversations with your clients. And so when you're setting traps for skunks, people need to leave your equipment alone. You need to be very, very clear about that. And if you have doubts, if you're working sometimes with an apartment building situation, where tenants often don't want to listen to the landlord for whatever reason, uh, things can get quite contentious and you need to be evaluating how are you going to trap these skunks, uh, in a situation where people won't leave your stuff alone. And so sometimes you have to get creative about hiding them. Uh, you have to get creative. I would certainly be using more of the box trap variety because people with trapped animals, they'll do stupid things. They'll be trying to feed them through the cage. You may say, they didn't do that with a skunk. You know, things happen. Um, uh, never underestimate the power of stupid people. Uh, so uh, you just want to make sure your contracts are written in such a way uh, that you have some protection here and use try to use some wisdom. And that can be hard. You're under stress and that sort of thing because you're trying to get jobs done and this can be quite expensive. So you need to make sure your pricing, your pricing model can handle some of these contingencies, uh, in, in, in that sort of thing. But for most of your residential lawns, these aren't going to be a problem. They're going to tie their dogs up. They're going to try to keep their kids away from the equipment. And it's not always a problem, but it can be. So always keep that in the back of your mind. If security, if, if, is an issue or people that would approach those traps, you'd want to use them in situations. You'd want to use box traps instead of cage traps. You can also use wood and plywood to block things off so that people don't have access. Uh, don't be afraid to use that. Um, I had one situation where I practically put a trap underground and then put boards over the top so that it was a school area and people would just see a board on the ground. And uh, so that would be, thankfully it was off, was outside of school, the school year, but you can see how you can get creative in ways on trying to, trying to trap animals. Uh, 
in ways that so that the public doesn't see that something's there. Uh, so you're going to have to think about getting creative. What are some books that can help you with skunks if, if you're looking for additional information? Um, I am a fan of Bob Noonan's book on skunks. He does has some really good dispatch information. I'm going to do another podcast on dispatching skunks. But his publication is certainly uh, inexpensive and available for you. Uh, certainly going to plug my own. Uh, the Wildlife Removal Handbook uh, has uh, information on skunks and a variety of other animals, as well as you know how to how to cage and box trap and do things with your business. And so that's available. Certainly, the Wildlife Removal Handbook, Bob Noonan's book on skunks. How would you spell his last name? It's Noonan, N O O N A N, and he's out of Maine. So he run he he controls the trapper predator caller. Uh, sorry, um, the trapper's post. My apologies, Bob. Um, trapper's post magazine that come out. Although he's kind of somewhat retired at this point, it's still going on. The trapper's post. Uh, there are those would be two publications that'd be quite helpful. And of course, the being kind, the animal pests. If you're looking for techniques on how to trap more. Uh, cage trap and box trap more humanely. There's some information on skunks uh, in that one as well, as well as a variety of other animals. So, but ultimately, use your cage traps. Make sure you're using enough equipment. Make sure you have your covers. You're wearing gloves. You're considering potential damage and you're barricading that out so the animal doesn't only has a choice, only has one choice coming into your coming into one of those traps. And then if you have, if you're worried about a trap on the out, uh, skunk on the outside, like a male coming in, you just face one of those traps facing out and bait that as well. So, and then of course, follow my instructions about knowing when you're going to be finished with that particular job because you don't want to close it off too soon. All right. I hope that's going to be helpful for you. It's hard to do that verbally, make you give the visual picture, but I'm hoping that got through for you. My name is uh, Stephen Van Tassel, wildlife control consultant with another episode of Living the Wild of Hey. We'd love to get feedback from you. Wildlife control consultant at gmail.com. Uh, love to get feedback from you about some topics that you like covered. And we'll try to cover uh, skunk dispatch and, tra- and, and accidental skunk issues probably next week. Thanks for listening. Back to you, Frank. Thank you for listening to the Pest Geek Podcast. If you have enjoyed the Pest Geek Podcast, please give us a rating, write a review, or subscribe to the channel. You can join the Pest Geek Society by visiting pestgeekpodcast.com. Thank you for listening. See you next time.